Hello, everyone. I'm Christy Jewell of Labroots, and I would like to welcome you to today's live broadcast, Advanced Quantitative Fluorescence Microscopy to Probe the Molecular Dynamics of Viral Entry, presented by Dr. Luis Alvarez, Product Application Manager, Functional Imaging at Leica Microsystems. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labroots and sponsored by Leica Microsystems. For more information on our sponsor, you can click on the logo on the left side of your screen or visit leica-microsystems.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that today's event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Additionally, you can share today's webinar on your personal social media. Just click on that social sharing tab to the left and let your friends and colleagues know about today's live event. Today's presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. At the conclusion of this webinar, click on the CE Credits tab located at the top of your screen and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, if you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on that support tab down at the top right of your presentation window, or you can use that ask a question box to let us know you're experiencing a problem. I would now like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Luis Alvarez, Product Application Manager, Functional Imaging at Leica Microsystems. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Welcome, Dr. Alvarez. You may now begin your presentation. Okay, thank you everyone for listening. And uh, let's see if we can uh, look a little bit at uh, viral entry and how we can uh, have a little bit more insight into some of the molecular events that facilitate uh, all of these. Uh, my contact information is on the screen. Uh, please feel free to contact me. And if you have additional questions after our question and answers at the end. Now, I'm going to start with uh, some generalities about confocal microscopy and viral research, and then we'll uh, spend the rest of the time looking at uh, two really nice papers from uh, the Sergi Padilla lab in Oxford, uh, where I was based before joining Leica. So uh, first thing is uh, something that uh, in French we'd like to say the garde fou or sanity checks for experimental setups. And this actually can be applied for host pathogen in general, not only viral research, but also bacteria. And this is the first concentrate on what is your bi biological question. What is the hypothesis that you would like to prove or disprove? And from there, actually choose an infection model. This is very important because only when you have defined this, then you can look at what is the best imaging approach that will fit not only the model, but that it will actually allow you to answer the question. Uh, we will see one of the examples today that sometimes uh, perhaps the best way to answer the question is not readily available. And so you have to come up with additional work or just make it happen. Now, Something very important for imaging is you need to always verify the infectivity of your virus. Always control. This is the most important thing. You want to make sure that uh, whatever uh, things you are observing are really part of the infectious process. In a similar way, you also want to ensure that you have a minimal disruption to your host. The cells have to react as natural as possible and to uh, reiterate what you would expect to happen uh, in nature or during an infection if you want to be able to extrapolate some of your data to uh, more complex models or even animal infection models. Now, uh, one thing that is uh, really nice uh, with the confocal microscope is that you have optical sectioning and the virus sizes uh, range from around 20 to 400 nanometers. And uh, without this op optical section, it is quite difficult to uh, resolve them. Uh, you can see actually some uh, sizes of some common viruses. Today, I will concentrate on HIV, which has uh, an approximate size of about 120 nanometers. 
Now, even if you're concentrating on the host response to the viral infection, uh, even then you, uh, it will be suitable to actually look at the viruses because otherwise it's almost impossible to differentiate the biological response that comes from uh, cell to cell uh, communication and from the actual infection process and to be able to actually uh, look at intervention strategies from the uh, viral response there. Now, I just want to recapitulate a couple of uh, classical things that we can do with uh, confocal imaging. And uh, these are first to be able to ascertain the spatial distribution of single viral particles in different compartments, either on fixed or live cells. And the second one is because of uh, this uh, capacity to look at the spatial distribution is to be able to localize the viral particles with other cellular components, uh, protein complexes, and so forth. And this also, if done in live cell, allows us to also probe dynamics of the infection process. This is really important because it is uh, a way to keep track of uh, the sequence of events that uh, lead to any given phenotype. And uh, lastly, uh, we can really look at the interplay between the host components and the viruses and uh, have a chance to look at what are the key aspects that uh, can either facilitate or prevent such infections. Now, today uh, I will be uh, talking to you to those examples that are based on HIV-1, and so I thought it would be important to recapitulate uh, uh, some aspects of uh, the HIV virus. You can see here uh, a figure that uh, is part of a review we published uh, in 2017. Uh, I'm happy to look at this. This is on the whereabouts of HIV-1 cellular entry and exclusion ports. And uh, it really goes over all of the details of uh, HIV entry uh, that were relevant at the time. Uh, now, one of the key aspects here is you can see in the bottom that we have an immature HIV uh, particle. Here, all of the components uh, are present, but these particles not in fact, uh, due to two things. One is that uh, the GAG proteins in the middle, the uh, uh, purple ones, have not been yet cleaved. Without this, actually, the mature GAG lattice uh, prevents the motility of the envelope outside, and uh, this inability to uh, move these spikes make these particles uh, non-infectious. The other thing is. Uh, these envelope glycoproteins that we see here in green are key for any infection. This is a really nice aspect because one, they define the tropism, so the kind of cells that they can infect, but two, also we can generate particles that are completely devoid of the envelope glycoprotein, and hence we can have an able to control in which we have viral particles that are 100% non infectious. Now, something nice about HIV is uh, there has been a lot of work done and uh, it's possible today to uh, target with fluorescent proteins to be able to visualize it directly. One is uh, on the GAC proteins. So if you mix some tag and non-tag GAC proteins, you can actually uh, visualize that. I have actually, uh, throughout my talk, uh, given some references to papers that you can read if you're interested in learning more about these things. Here's one from uh, uh, Sergi Padilla while he was with uh, Greg Melikan on GAG GFP. But uh, a little uh, couple years after that, actually, uh, from the Matsuda lab came out a really nice paper in which they were uh, able to actually tag the envelope glycoproteins. These are very uh, specific tags in some of the loops with superfolded GFP that allow you to still have a particle that is infectious nevertheless with a tag spike, which is really nice. Additional work has been done even before this on uh, HIV virus in which we can have fusion reporters. Uh, this is a really nice work that allows you to have a beta lactamase uh, cleaving protein uh, together with the VPR. So this means that actually once the virus uh, infects a cell and crosses, then uh, the membrane, it releases this beta lactamase, and uh, you can have a fair reporter. I will uh, talk a little bit more about this later on today. Okay, so let's dig into our first question, and this is the effects of cell metabolism on the HIV entry. 
So here we can see uh, some uh, cells. These are uh, TZMBL cells uh, that have a reporter, a FRED reporter, and you uh, may be able to see some of the viral particles. Well, uh, although you have viral particles in numerous cells, only the ones showing up in red are actually uh, have been infected. So there's something quite interesting when you're doing host pathogen uh, research is that uh, in time, you may get all cells to be infected. But when you look at time zero, time one and two, you will see that actually uh, in fact, the infection does not happen all at once, but you have uh, heterogeneity of infections. Not all cells are infected at the same time and with the same um, amount. This uh, basically yields kind of a patchy uh, result at first. And this actually has some interesting implications. It says that there are some cells that are more likely than others to infect. If you have put uh, the viruses in all cells at the same time, uh, and this suggests that there could be some natural sensitivity to infection and also some natural resistance to infection. So uh, we actually, uh, well, we were discussing this with Sergi uh, when I uh, uh, joined him in Oxford. Uh, we thought that it would be really nice to have a way to look at this. And this was uh, some of uh, the starting points to come up with uh, a really nice project that ended up on the paper I will present today. Uh, now, from this, we had an hypothesis. We knew that uh, the differences in infectivity or resistance are not uh, genetic because all of these cells are the same. So it means that there are factors that can determine this resistance or sensitivity, and this has to be linked to something else, and we hypothesized that these changes could be due to metabolism. So uh, I will show you uh, first that this is the case. So, and then we will see how uh, through imaging we can actually decipher the mechanisms that underlie it. So here we see actually a percentage of infection in cells and we can see that when we add two deoxyglucose to uh, basically disrupt uh, the metabolism of the cells, uh, would increase uh, DG, and then we have a decrease in infection. So this actually shows that there's a reduction on HIV-1 VSVG envelope when we're trying to infect MT4 T cells with an increasing dose of 2-deoxyglucose. MT4 T cells actually uh, behave metabolically and uh, for infection purposes, just like CD4 uh, plus uh, T cells. So uh, again, I will touch on some of the key experiments shown in this paper uh, that was published earlier this year but I'll invite you to uh, go and read for all of the details and to have a complete view of what has been published. Okay, here we can see uh, now a set of images in which we have first uh, just cells with vehicle with, without uh, any treatment in the presence of HIV GRFL. These cells have uh, a reporter that allows us to see fusion. And here the fusion positive cells are in red and fus uh, fusion negative are in green. And we can see that when we increase the doses of 2-deoxyglucose, actually the percentage of uh, red over green actually decrease. And we can see it here on the graph here. So this is with uh, TZMBL cells that are reporter cells that allow us to actually look at fusion directly. So we wanted to actually understand exactly what is the process that is happening here. And uh, for this, actually, we uh, did a multiplex experiment in which we are going to combine a couple of tools. First, we have cell sculpture with uh, gridded color slips. This is very important because it allows us to actually be able to trace back the cells that we have imaged over time. And these cells will actually have a genetically encoded biosensor, in this case Percival, that actually allows us to measure the ratio of ATP over ADP. And we're going to do that with fluorescence lifetime imaging. Uh, again, I will not go on the details of fluorescent lifetime imaging today. Uh, there is a lot of literature on this, and uh, there's actually a webinar also on the basics of FLIM 
that uh, I gave last year if you're interested. Now, this will allow us to see uh, what is the metabolism of uh, the cells before infection. We will add uh, viral uh, particles of HIV. And then actually what uh, these cells will allow us to do also is uh, between 12 and 24 hours later with uh, exhale assay to be able to tell which of the cells have been infected. And then we can correlate actually what was the uh, metabolism of the cell before infection and whether it got infected or not. So this looks like so. You see uh, on top you have the TCMBL cells with uh, Percival, looking at the ATP over ADP ratio. And in the bottom, uh, the ones with adlaconic uh, acid reporter with the same rationale. So we can see we can here determine with the x cal which of the cells uh, have been infected, and we can then trace back each one of the cells to their, uh, for instance, lifetime imaging uh, parameters, and from this we can actually build these graphs at the end. And we can see that actually the infection positive cells have both a higher ATP to ADP ratio and a higher lactate concentration. So this confirms that uh, the cells that actually exhibit higher metabolism to begin with are the ones that are more most likely to be infected down the road. Now, um, this is a little bit uh, difficult as an assay because you have to wait until the infection process has taken place 12 to 24 hours later. So uh, we decided to uh, do another multiplex experiment um, and uh, so this is all of the work from uh, Chad, uh, the PhD student in the lab. And uh, in this case, uh, again, use the same biosensors, Percival or the laconic acid biosensor, but this time actually multiplex it with a FRET biosensor for fusion. It's called an iBlend fusion virus fusion. And in this case, actually, uh, we have the VPR, one of the uh, viral proteins inside of the HIV that is linked to a beta-lactamase. So whenever the cell, as I said before, crosses the membrane, then it will have the ability to cut this uh, dye that has been loaded into the cells. And so in the presence of VPR blam, then the threat is disrupted, and we can actually tell that that cell has been infected. So in this case, uh, the interesting part is that we can uh, have uh, better timing on or on the readout of the fusion compared to the metabolism. So we don't have to wait multiple hours after the fact to find out whether a cell has actually seen a fusion event. So we can see some of the images here. So on the top, we can see actually, uh, again, the gridded uh, slides with the cells. And if we see a blowout of this in the BLAM, you can see that you have either uh, the red or the green uh, cells. And this is a threshold that says up which cell has been infected or not. And at the same time, we can do our fluorescence like imaging. And in this case, uh, we can have the readout on a cell-by-cell -cell basis and uh, recapitulate what is happening. Here we can see that uh, this correlates uh, nicely with uh, the infection process that we saw with the x that uh, relatively high lactate concentrations compared to uh, the non-infected cells. And this is uh, statistically significant. So what we have seen so far is that uh, there seems to be a preference for high metabolism uh, for HIV to infect cells. Uh, it does not mean that the ones that exhibit uh, lower metabolisms do not get infected, but uh, it's just the probability of infection is higher with uh, increased metabolism here. So I'm going to uh, now switch to another really nice experiment uh, that uh, was performed here. And this is actually uh, continuing in this direction of what now is the link between changing metabolism and the ability to infect 
what is actually changing that will affect directly the viral entry. And one of the hypotheses here is that uh, the metabolism could have some effects on uh, some of the lipid structures in the membrane, specifically on cholesterol. And the uh, amount of cholesterol in the membrane uh, changing with the metabolism will change actually the fluidity on the membranes and directly affect the ability for HIV to enter or not into the cells. So in order to probe this, uh, then uh, Sergi conducted, uh, conducted uh, uh, Bo Liu uh, that uh, had just published a nice Fred Flynn uh, probe that can allow you to assess changes in the membrane tension. And you can see here uh, an image on how this works. So this actually uh, changes the distance between the acceptor and the donor on the Fred probe, uh, depending on uh, how much uh, changes in lipids from order to on order lipids there are in the membrane. So then it is just a matter of multiplexing. So we have actually now uh, m cherry uh, HIV uh, variant that can come into the membrane, interact with the receptor and the co-receptor, and then if in the other side of the membrane we have this MSS probe, then we could actually uh, tell what is the tension at the membrane at the spot where the viral can fuse. The nice thing is that with these uh, viral particles, we can really tell uh, the timing of the hemifusion port and the operand of the fusion port and uh, have a correlation between the timing when this happened and whatever changes in membrane tension we have. So again, in this case, we have MTRI GAG, HIV, GRFL for single virus tracking, and in the other size, side of this experiment, in the host side, we'll have the MSS transfected probe into the ZMBL cells. This allows to have all of the machinery, the receptors, co-receptors of HIV, but also all of the reporter uh, machinery that we need to have this in a dynamic way. So. Uh, some of the images look like so. So you have uh, the MSS probe that you see here at the membrane. And you can see that uh, there is a tiny HIV uh, particle that has attached to the membrane. We can look at the difference in time and then follow this across. And then from this, we can actually start measuring uh, the lifetime changes and the intensity changes and correlate what happens. Okay, so uh, the results look like so. So we have uh, the changes in uh, m cherry signal here in red. So we can see actually that we have a point right here in which the intensity starts to drop substantially. This actually corresponds to the future port opening. Now, we can see here two traces, one in green and one in gray. The one in green corresponds to the fluorescence lifetime of the MSS probe around the spot where we have the m cherry signal. So we're looking at a colocalization of signal between the virus particle and the membrane. And the gray dots correspond to uh, the cell membrane of the same cells, but away from where the viral particle is. This allows us to see that there is a substantial uh, fluctuation on membrane tension across, but it is interesting that uh, subsequent to the fusion port opening, we actually have a stabilization of a lower tension in the membrane in the place where the virus is. And this lasts uh, a significant amount of time and corresponds to a stabilization of a low tension. And then this actually is recovered on top. Okay. This actually shows us that there are local tension changes that are happening exactly at the time that uh, viral fusion is undergoing. Now, this is easily seen in here, and here actually we have 
uh, four experiments uh, with their error bars around it. And the first thing that we can see is that there are local tension changes during viral fusion. That is the green trace that you can see here. And exactly when HIV fusion is taking place, we have this drop. Now, uh, in the uh, presence of two deoxyglucose, uh, again, if you remember correctly, this is when the proportion of infection drops. Actually, we see then no change in tension uh, around the HIV particle. And the interesting thing is that if we now treat with 2-deoxyglucose, but then we add cholesterol, then actually we restore this drop in tension. This uh, completes uh, the story. Uh, again, I have uh, obviously skipped a lot of other parts from the paper. So again, please, if this uh, uh, sparked your interest, go and read the paper. Uh, but it shows that first, uh, higher metabolism is uh, more permissive to HIV-1 infection. If you have an acute treatment of 2-deoxyglucose, actually the percentage of infected cells drops significantly. And when this happens, actually one of the changes that is observed is the amount of cholesterol in the membrane. And this actually uh, makes it the uh, fluidic parts of the membrane more or less available for viral entry. Now, this correlates to the ability of the HIV virus to uh, go from hemifusion to full fusion. Basically, in the case of low uh, cholesterol availability at the membrane, then most of the HIV uh, particles will stay at an arrested hemifusion state and do not proceed to full fusion. So all in all, this allows us to have a very nice mechanistic view of uh, the metabolism of cells and the correlation that it has with HIV infection. Now, let's switch gears a little bit more, and let's look a little bit at uh, some other work that we had here. And so uh, just to recapitulate, uh, HIV, uh, can enter either, uh, so we have CD4, it's the main receptor for HIV, but then there is uh, one, uh, at least two core receptors that can uh, be used by the virus. One is CCR5 and the other one is CXCR4. So this, uh, depending on which kind of virus you have, you will use one or the other one. And uh, the strains really determine which one it is. This also has an impact of where the viral fuses, either on the plasma membrane or uh, the endosomal uh, fusion. Again, this is recapitulated really nicely on the paper uh, that uh, Maria uh, wrote as first author in the lab. And I invite you to uh, go have a read. But in this case, uh, what we want is to understand what are the cellular mechanisms that make this viral fusion happen. Okay, so we know that uh, receptor and co-receptor are needed, and then uh, it will be really nice to be able to actually understand how they come together when HIV uh, comes into play to create a fusion pore. So in this case, we use fluorescently tagged receptor and co-receptor and an attack HIV particle as well. And we're going to use single molecule detection on the confocal volume to exactly find out what is going on at the molecular level here. So for this, uh, we use number and brightness, which uh, might not be very familiar to uh, many people, but this uh, was originally worked out by uh, Enrico Graton and Michel Dickman in 2008 at the LFD. And uh, the reference is here if you want to uh, find out more about it. Uh, the principle is quite straightforward. It means that if you have a, a focal volume here and you see particles inside that are green and there are six of them, if the six of them are individual molecules, then you have a certain average over time. 
Now, if you see if the same six particles actually come and now are dimers, so now you have three dimers, all six molecules, the average intensity will remain the same, but the amplitude of the, flux, of the fluctuations will differ. This is what we see here. The frequency of uh, the dimers compared to the monomers is different. And when looking at this, this is how we can actually tell the oligomeric state of individual molecules coming into our focal volume. Now, uh, for this to be applicable to uh, our HIV research, we had to do some work, and this uh, can be found in a couple of papers, and one is a new algorithm for uh, dealing with the traces that you get out of this, uh, published um, in 2017 by Informatics, and the other one is uh, a guide on how to implement number and brightness. It's basically everything I would have liked to know uh, when we started the project and that we find out uh, to make this project happen. Uh, again, if you're interested on apply, applying these uh, advanced imaging techniques, this is a good starting point. And uh, just to make a long story short, uh, this is what we did with HIV. So we have actually uh, receptor and co-receptor here in green and uh, blue traces. And we're going to look at a cross variance to see if there's interaction between the receptor and the co-receptor. At the same time, on a third channel, we're going to track the virus, and then we're going to see if we have interaction between uh, CD4 and CCR5, for example, that is positive. Then we see if that colocalizes with the virus particle, and if that is the case, then we can go back and look at the oligomeric state of each one of them, and this will allow us to build up the time resolve stoichiometry of the whole thing. And we can do that uh, dynamically through time. It looks like so. Uh, here, we only have time zero and time 1.7 minutes, and you can see that we are chasing a viral particle in this insert in cyan. You can see when we actually see a viral particle, and then exactly in the same area, we will actually, in the right uh, and the left side, far left, we have the CCR4 uh, signal and the uh, CD4 signal. Now, as time goes by, this evolves, and then suddenly we start having a positive uh, cross-correlation uh, that is, shows up here in green in the insert. This means that CD4 and CIS, uh, XCR4 are interacting, and then we can go back in the brightnesses and actually get the oligomeric states. This allows us to build this graph here, in which we have uh, on time, the oligomeric state of each one, the receptor and the co-receptor. And uh, we know that they're both uh, interacting at the same time. The nice thing is that we can redo this experiment and add a neutralizing antibody as well. And when we do so, actually what we see is that first, there is no interaction between CD4 and CXCR4. And also the uh, complete uh, stoichiometry of receptor and co-receptor has changed. So all of these imaging experiments, uh, what allow us to do is to go back into the literature and start understanding what is happening dynamically for all of the structures of HIV over time. So uh, this graph that I, I just showed you uh, can be represented, uh, like we see here in the right side, in three steps. Step one, in which the envelope uh, from HIV actually hooks into a CD4. And in this step, uh, this recruitment of CD4 by the envelope actually recruits CXCR4 as a dimer. CXCR4 is a GPCR, so this actually triggers signaling from uh, the core receptor down. And this actually uh, goes into a uh, six um, CD4s and a uh, 2CXCR4 formation. Two of them disassemble, creating an anchoring domain that uh, then goes into fusion. So you can see how actually having all of these steps with the number of molecules at each one of the state and knowing that they have a correlation together allows us to build a complete view 
of the first seven minutes of the fusion pulse formation. In a similar way, with a different tropism with GRFL variants, then we can actually look at the what happens with CD4 and CCR5, and we see that actually uh, there are still three steps, but they are slightly different. And I just wanted to point out here, these are the PDB entries of all of these structures that have been known. Obviously, cryo uh, electron microscopy structures, cryo structures, or uh, classical um, uh, crystallography structures uh, are not dynamic. You only get a specific point in time, and you can have only that view. And we can see that now, because we can see the whole stoichiometry of the reaction, we can actually plug in uh, all of the different um, structural views that have been observed to date into a comprehensive model and make sense of the whole dynamics here. Uh, as I mentioned before, we can do this also with uh, the neutralizing antibodies, such as uh, B12 here. And then this allows us to uh, build a dynamic model of when uh, this inhibition is happening and to what epitodes. So we can really understand the temporal mechanisms of these antibodies, and this method could allow us to determine which antibodies can actually work synergistically together. Because if you have uh, inhibition of, say, uh, step one but not two, and then you have a different neutralizing antibody that can neutralize step three but not one, then you would expect that actually working together you will have a more um, strong effect to HIV entry. This will be very helpful for vaccine design and actually certainly has been awarded an ERC consolidator grant to continue these studies. And the title of uh, this project is Single Molecule Engine Based Design of HIV vaccines. So uh, I'm going to finish on this note and I hope that uh, you have seen the value of what uh, quantitative advanced imaging can do on viral research. We can really multiplex the different aspects of uh, cellular signaling, changes in metabolism, and so forth with uh, the aspects of viral entry. Uh, this is also possible with viral egress and other aspects of the viral infection process. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I hope that you have seen uh, the powerful tools that allows us to have a really, really nice detailed view on each one of the steps of the dynamic process of HIV infection. Uh, I wanted to point out this because as all biology is dynamic, uh, having a complete view of uh, when the infection starts and how it proceeds can really open new views on how we can intervene, where we can intervene, and perhaps have uh, some uh, newer ideas of uh, targets and epitopes that we can um, study to have other inhibitors or uh, new vaccines for this. I'm going to finish with thanking the people that make this work possible. Uh, more importantly, to Sergi and that uh, led the lab and that uh, allowed me to uh, learn a lot from him and work on these exciting pro projects while I was in Oxford. He has now uh, moved to King's College. Uh, I have put it uh, the website of his lab if you're interested in contacting him. But also to uh, now Dr. Rory Nolan, he was a PhD student there and he is responsible for all of the uh, mathematics that uh, allows us to do number and brightness. Uh, Aro, Maria, that actually did uh, all of the cellular work for our uh, structural paper um, and um, the other people around in Oxford, uh, Professor Thomas Bowden and uh, Michael Dustin for their help in all of this work. Now, I want to thank you all of you for your attention, and I would like to open it up for questions. Dr. Alvarez, thank you for that excellent presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. Now to our audience, if you have any questions you would like to ask, 
If you haven't already done so, please do so now. We have lots of questions already coming in, and we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So Dr. Alvarez, let's start with this one, and this one is two parts. How would you visualize single viral particles without fluorescence tagged viruses? For example, SARS or CoV-2, and would anti-spike antibody staining be sufficient to quantitate viral particles, either with an SP8 or a STED? Uh, well, again, thank you everyone for listening. And uh, again, I just want to uh, point out this, uh, a lot of great work that we did in Oxford. So uh, you can obviously visualize viral, viral particles if you are not able to genetically intact them. Uh, it always depends on the question you're trying to answer. So if what you want to see is the dynamics of uh, viral entry, for example, uh, it is possible to actually uh, label them with lipophilic uh, dyes. And this is actually quite nice because you can actually track a particle and then as soon as it hits uh, the cellular membrane, what you would see is a spike in fluorescence when actually the uh, the dyes actually get diluted into the cell, so you can have the exact timing of uh, opening the pore from a heavy fusion. Uh, that is one option. Uh, now, the other one is related to the antibodies. So, uh, yes, you can visualize uh, viral particles with antibodies, but not dynamically, because uh, most antibodies uh, will actually prevent infection from happening. Uh, and uh, But what you can do in this case is that you can uh, do the infections, and then uh, do fixations at different time points, and then you can use antibodies. Uh, it is not straightforward to do, but it is possible to actually do a quantification in this regard. And uh, we were actually asked uh, to do a number of uh, super resolution experiments to validate our dynamic uh, number and brightness uh, studies. So in the uh, Network Structural Molecular Biology paper, uh, there are some strategies to do exactly this. So it is possible with antibodies. We use actually nanobodies, uh, and it, it's it's possible. It's a little bit more difficult. You need to understand where the antibody is binding, and you need to have some controls. Thank you, Dr. Alvarez. Now our next question. To what extent do you have to minimize the amount of FP expression with GAG and AMV fusions to, pre to preserve maturation and infectivity? Is one protein more tolerant than the other? Okay, so uh, this uh, first thing is they're not comparable at all. So on the GAG is uh, relatively well known, and uh, usually you don't want to have more than 50% of the GAG proteins tagged. Otherwise, you actually end up with uh, the, the percentage of immature viruses actually increases once you cross that threshold. Um, now, on the spikes, it is much more complicated because you have to take into account that each one of these spikes is a trimer that needs to actually lock into a specific position to be infections. And so uh, the, the work that I cited actually is uh, quite good in looking at this and uh, the ones that you can use. And uh, in this case, uh, I would just follow exactly the paper from Atsuda. Um, and uh, you have to do the real controls. But in this case, uh, tagging actually the spikes of any virus, so any uh, glycoprop enveloped glycoprotein is going to be much more delicate than uh, internal proteins such as GAG. Thank you. Dr. Alvarez, your IBLAM data, it looks like more green cells rather than reduction in infection. Can you comment on that? Well. Uh, Again, when you're looking at IBLAM data, what you want to do is a statistical analysis. And so you take the overall number of cells and then you compare actually the proportion on, on the infection versus non-infected. And this is the only way that you can actually assess whether there is a reduction or not, because it's the overall percentage of infected cells from the whole population. So what you saw there is just one field, but obviously the data does not come from a single field in microscopy. Can this technology be used to identify unknown viral receptors? No. So uh, th this technology is uh, used to uh, study the stoichiometry, the mechanisms. So uh, the problem with unknown receptors is that you need to identify them. Um, and 
how would you be able to trace back which receptor is the one doing this work? So what you can do is, without knowing the receptor, you can study actually uh, the changes at the membrane, for example, the changes in tensions and all that, and know that uh, a different kind of virus or different strains or different cells behave differently. This you could do, but it will be impossible to actually know which is the receptor that is responsible for it. For uh, tracking which receptors are needed, actually you need to have different kind of technologies and you need to be able to have some sequences. Even either have um, a set of uh, cells that have uh, different mutations and different receptors and you can see which ones are the ones that are infective and uh, are permissible to infection and which ones are not. This is one option. The other option is actually uh, to uh, do some fixation experiments in which you actually uh, get a virus onto cells and then the ones that actually can look, uh, lock into cells then actually have some strategies to cross-link uh, the virus to whatever receptor is on top of the membrane. And if you have this enough times, you could actually do some uh, mass-spec experiments out of these and actually get the peptide sequences that corresponds to the unknown receptors and from there go to a library and identify the receptors that could match this. But this is a, a different kind of work. Dr. Alvarez, thank you so much for this Q&A session. Unfortunately, we are out of time and unable to take any more live questions. I do want to encourage our audience there were so many questions that came in that we are unable to answer. These questions will be answered via email to the email address that you provided when you registered for today's webinar. Today's webinar can be viewed on demand, and LabRoots will send you an email following this webinar when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. One big, big thank you to Dr. Luis Alvarez for his time today and his important research. Thank you also to Leica Microsystems for sponsoring today's event. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day.